Hello, welcome to the Judge Ben Show. My name is Ben Joseph and I'm a retired Vermont trial judge. This is a program in which I interview people and uh, talk about current issues that involve the, the law and the courts. Last year, uh, Vermont's legislature passed a law permitting retail sales of marijuana, which will start, I think, in October of this year. The law also set up something called the Cannabis Control Board, uh, which is to make rules, for example, on the amount of uh, THC, which is a tetrahydrocannabinoid, I think is the word it stands for. It's a chemical that's in, in the cannabis that causes, uh, it gets you high, you know, for want of a better description. Um, I'm going to read from uh, a press release that the Vermont Medical Society put out. It's not too long. Uh, then I'm going to go to uh, speaking with my guest, who's uh, Sharon Levy, who is a, oh, a doctor uh, and who works at Boston Children's Hospital. I didn't mention this to her earlier, but uh, I just saw an article that suggested that because um, cannabis is legal in Massachusetts, that last year they had $2 billion of sales. Um, and as a consequence, they collected, uh, I think it's $200 million. Um, I think it kind of goes to the heart of what this is all about. That, uh, as they used to say, where I came from, money talks. But uh, I'm hoping that people will, will understand there should be more controls on the way this stuff is done. And that the Cannabis Control Board will uh, limit the amount of hallucinogen, THC, that's in, in these products that are going to be sold. So without further ado, I will uh, read from the press release that was put out oh, a little less than two months ago by the Vermont Medical Society. Uh, let's see, they headline their press release, Vermont Medical Society calls for commercial cannabis potency limits, no advertising, and for warning labels to include mental health risks. Montpelier, November 30, 2021, the Vermont Medical Society, which represents 2,400 physicians and physician assistants across Vermont, has adopted a policy resolution urging the Vermont Cannabis Control Board and the Vermont legislature to require that all cannabis grown, produced, or sold in the state contain less than 15% THC. That's the, uh, that's the thing that makes people high tetrahydrocannabinoid. Only took me a week to learn how to say that, but I got it done. The uh, Vermont Medical Society policy opposes all cannabis advertising and advocates for cannabis products and advertising to list evidence-based health risks associated with cannabis use, including psychosis and suicide attempts in persons with no prior mental health history, uncontrollable vomiting, dangerous driving, addiction, and harm to fetuses and nursing babies. I should interject here that I, I keep pretty close track on the number of people killed each year by persons driving under the influence of marijuana. Last year, that number was 18. There are another 16 people killed in accidents where the driver was under both the influence of both alcohol and marijuana. So uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a steep price to pay for the use of this drug. These public health and mental health risks are of immediate concern because Vermont currently has the nation's highest past month cannabis use, including use of high potency, that is greater than 15% THC products. Evidence shows cannabis use, especially with potency greater than 15% THC, is associated with increased urgent and emergency department psychiatric visits and increase mental health disorders, wow. including psychosis. It is also associated with increased urgent non-psychiatric visits for respiratory distress, cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. Oh, I won't try to pronounce that one again. Uh, that, that means uncontrollable vomiting and poisonings. However, in Vermont, there is a significantly inappropriate low perception of harm of cannabis use. Most Vermonters 
associate legalized cannabis sales with marijuana from the 1990s when the THC levels were less than 2%. Yet in states like Colorado and Washington where commercial cannabis sales have already been legalized, THC potency has dramatically increased with averages for marijuana flower ranging from 17 to 28% and for concentrates such as dabs and waxes as high as 90% THC. Wow. The Cannabis Control Board is currently drafting proposed regulations in order to implement Vermont's commercialized market for cannabis sales, which is slated to begin in the fall of 2022. Last week, the CCB, that is the Cannabis Control Board, released proposed rules, which include drafting label, uh, label language that leaves out all mention of serious mental health effects associated with cannabis use, including the increased risk of addiction, anxiety, psychosis, suicide attempt, or self-injurious behavior. The Vermont Medical Society president and psych uh, was a psychiatrist, I think this is Simi Robin, stated, quote, at a time when Vermonters are facing filled hospital beds, crowded emergency departments, and prolonged wait times for inpatient mental health treatment, Vermont's medical professionals believe Vermonters deserve accurate information about the risk of cannabis use, and they should not have <clears throat> commercial access to high-risk, high-potency products. That's the end of the quote. The Vermont Medical Society policy also urges the Vermont CCB and state leaders to dedicate adequate resources to statewide prevention and education efforts that include cannabis use prevention, and education at schools and in underserved communities. Evidence-based after-school activities to decrease high-risk behaviors among adolescents. Treatment of cannabis use disorder and informing state leaders, the media and the public of the increased cost and burden to our healthcare system caused by cannabis use, especially greater than 15% THC cannabis use, including emergency room crowding, and overburdening cannabis addiction, psychosis, suicide attempt or self-injurious behavior, mental illness, cannabis vomiting syndrome, child poisonings, and driving in injuries. Um, let's see. It's, there's a, a little blurb here at the end promoting a medical society, which I think I ought to read. The Vermont Medical Society is the leading voice of physicians in the state and is dedicated to optimizing the health of all Vermonters and the healthcare environment in which Vermont physicians and physician assistants practice medicine. The society serves its 2,400 members through public policy advocacy on the state and federal levels, as well as by providing <clears throat> legal, administrative, and educational support, producing a rich flow of news and information and offering member benefits that increase medical practice effectiveness and efficiency. Um, so that, that caught my attention when it came out for obvious reasons. Um, in my time on the bench, I saw a lot of sad things that have happened uh, because people were using this drug. I'm very, very happy to say today that I have a guest from Massachusetts whom I hope you can see on your screen. <laughs> that, uh, that guest is Dr. Sharon Levy. You're a doctor of medicine, is that right? Yes, I am a pediatrician and um, I have specialty boards in developmental behavioral pediatrics and also addiction medicine. Oh, wow. And you work at Boston Children's Hospital, is that right? I do. I direct the Adolescent Substance Use and Addiction Program. Um, we opened back in 2000, and we were the first substance use disorders uh, specialty program situated at a children's hospital in the country. So we have a pretty long history of taking care of, of kids with substance use problems and disorders. Well, that, those are the credentials I, I like to hear when I have a guest on talking about these subjects. Um, do you have a connection with the Harvard Medical School? Uh, well, I, I do. I'm on the faculty at Harvard Medical School. I'm an associate professor there. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. 
Uh, do you supervise other doctors and therapists as part of your job at the Children's Hospital? Um, so um, one of the uh, activities that we do at, at, in, in ASAP um, is that we run a, a fellowship training program. So for guests who may not know, doctors go through a lot of training, right? You know, there's medical school. After you finish medical school, you do um, internship and residency training. I think a lot of people uh, probably are familiar with that. And that is in your primary specialty. So for example, for somebody like me, that was in pediatrics. So I spent three or four years doing that training. After completing that, um, doctors can go on and subspecialize. Uh, so I'm subspecialized as an addiction medicine uh, specialist. And uh, we run uh, a program that takes uh, physicians after they complete their residency training um, to do a one year of clinical training in pediatric addiction medicine. So um, they, they learn how to take care of kids with substance use disorders uh, by working with us. Well, how many patients do you deal with in a typical year, do you know? So uh, last year we completed uh, 5,000 visits. Um, it, that was with uh, you know, somewhere between 500 and 1,000 unique patients. At any given time, we have uh, four to 500 patients enrolled in our outpatient program. So those are patients who we're keeping in touch with who are actively engaged in outpatient therapy with us. Well, what are the typical problems you, you see when dealing with adolescents that are caused by marijuana, by cannabis? Same thing. Um, so uh, you mentioned, and the statement mentioned, the most common problems. Uh, you know, I, I would actually say that the biggest problem that we see is addiction. Um, so one thing that we know about the adolescent brain is it's still developing, and um, it is uh, particularly vulnerable um, to being interested in trying psychoactive substances like cannabis. Um, you know, kids are risk takers. Um, they also uh, do things, they like to look for uh, activities that'll be very, very exciting. So we know that, right? We know that in general, that's the kind of behaviors that we see that we expect in high school kids and young adults. Um, we also know that, that uh, their brain is developing and that the, the kind of the breaks on behaviors, the things that help uh, adults to control impulses and to, to self-monitor and to uh, make good decisions, uh, those skills are still developing during adolescence. And it turns out that during that period, right, where kids are so drawn to high-risk activities and at the same time don't have the neurological hardware yet in place that's going to help them uh, reliably make good decisions, uh, during that time period, kids are susceptible to developing the, the neurologic changes in the brain um, that, uh, that cause addiction. And when I say addiction, I'm really talking about loss of control over substance use, right? And so uh, I think people in their mind's eye uh, have a good picture of this. Um, for example, with cigarettes, right? They're uh, probably everybody knows somebody who smokes cigarettes or uses nicotine who would like to stop but finds that they can't, right? That, that smoking has become kind of a reflex for them. And they, as much as they would really like to give it up, um, they, they find they, they can quit, but they can't really maintain it, right? Um, same thing happens with other substances as well, right? I mean, we know that it happens with alcohol. There are people who really just can't um, stop drinking even though they want to. It certainly happens with opioids. And it happens with cannabis or marijuana as well, uh, that people become addicted to it and they can't control their use. And so even when they want to stop, um, they really struggle with that. And people develop addictions typically during their adolescence. Some of the, some of the problems may not present until a little bit later, uh, but something like uh, 90 to 95% of, of uh, adults who have and addiction started using substances before their 18th birthday. Um, and so, uh, I, you know, I, I would put that as number one on the list because we know that people with addictions, people who use cannabis chronically, 
actually have worse outcomes across a number of domains in adulthood. So they do, uh, they attain lesser education uh, and job uh, uh, performance. Uh, they're less likely to, uh, you know, establish fulfilling relationships and have their own families. Um, and that's all been very, very uh, well documented. Um, and so, I, I, you know, I think that a lot of these are long-term consequences, uh, but the addiction really does start in adolescence. And, and really, I, I think it's incumbent upon all of us um, to uh, really try and protect our kids during this vulnerable phase of development and, and really make sure that they don't uh, go down that path. So it's a very long answer. I would say addiction is, is, you know, for me, the number one concern with adolescent substance use. Some of the other things you mentioned, um, people who use cannabis, particularly those who use during their adolescence are much more likely to develop mental health disorders, including psychotic disorders. You talked a little bit about psychosis and acute psychotic episodes that bring people into hospitals. You also mentioned cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. That's a syndrome of uncontrolling vom uh, uncontrolled vomiting. We often, many of us probably think of cannabis as something that uh, reduces nausea and uh, stimulates appetite. And that's true in low dose, but as we've seen uh, these products become more and more concentrated, actually uh, cannabis can do the opposite. And so, this used to be a very uh, rare condition in my experience. And now probably not a week goes by without me uh, getting a consult for a patient either in an emergency room or in a, uh, or a consult from a pediatrician colleague asking how to manage this problem. So clearly it's becoming much more common. Wow. Um... Well, by addiction, is, when someone becomes addicted to this stuff, does it mean they have to use it all the time? Yeah, so when somebody becomes uh, addicted to a substance, what it really means is that they've, they've, they've kind of lost control. I, I think maybe Mark Twain put it best. He said, quitting smoking's easy. I've done it a million times, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so really what that points to is that uh, when, uh, when addiction develops, substance use almost becomes a, a reflex or, or sort of the default behavior, right? And so um, people, uh, they can stop using, right? But, but typically they have to muster a lot of energy to stop using, okay? Because using has almost become a reflex. Think of it like breathing, right? Breathing is a reflex. We don't have to think about it, we just do it. Now you can actually suppress the reflex, you can hold your breath, right? But eventually the reflex is going to take over and you're going to start breathing again, right? Now, in obviously with breathing, that's a good thing. With, um, <laughs> with substance use, when that reflex develops, people can actually control, they can choose not to use an, for any given episode, right? Um, and, you know, typically what people find is when they decide to quit, they can go a couple of weeks, you know, maybe a, a month or two, what they're, what's really happening is that they're using a lot of mental energy to, to suppress the, the reflex. And eventually what often happens is people find themselves using again, kind of when they let their guard down a little. Now, I do want to say for people out there that uh, treatment works. Uh, you know, I, I'm an addiction medicine specialist, so I fully believe that. I wouldn't have gone into the field if I didn't think there was anything that we can do about it. And we can certainly help people rewire their own brains and, and sort of, you know, kind of undo that reflex that's developed. Um, so, you know, I, not, it's not that all hope is lost, but it is uh, a condition. If left untreated, I, you know, people end up um, often, you know, with, uh, with uh, with consequences, right? With you know health consequences, with mental health consequences, um, with with all kinds of um, untoward problems. So uh, we want to do everything that we can to prevent this from developing in adolescence. Uh, and then when people uh, do develop addictions, we want to make sure that there are resources available for them uh, that they can access, so that uh, you know, so that we can help them recover. 
when I read this uh, thing from the Medical Society, I, I inferred from what, what they were saying that the, uh, the cannabis with a higher THC content is more likely to cause addiction and health problems. Did I get that right? Yeah, that's absolutely right. And so that's a, a problem across the board with addictive substances. So we need, we need different kinds of regulation when we're talking about addictive substances as compared to non-addictive substances. Um, the, the difficulty with state-based regulation is that uh, states don't really have the infrastructure uh, to do that kind of regulation, right? Typically, we expect uh, the Food and Drug Administration to, to put those regulations in place. And we have, we've learned a lot of lessons, some of them very hard come, right? I, you know, we know um, people who are watching may know uh, that for a long time, uh, the FDA did not have jurisdiction over tobacco, right? Um, but that changed uh, under the Obama administration. And uh, now the FDA actually uh, does have jurisdiction. And so they can regulate tobacco. It's obviously tobacco is a product with a lot of potential harms for public health. But what we've seen over the past 20 years is actually quite significant decreases in smoking among adults and kids, but even more dramatic amongst the kids. Um, and so- Are you talking about teenagers? Is that I'm talking about teenagers and I'm talking specifically about tobacco use. So these regulations can work and, uh, uh, and, and they're really critically important. Now you take the case of, of, of vaping, and I'm talking a lot about nicotine because I think it's illustrative here. Uh, when, when these new e-cigarette products came out, uh, they were initially not regulated by the FDA. Um, and that was actually kind of a loophole um, that has subsequently been closed, but it took a long time to close the loophole. And so we had this period of time where um, manufacturers didn't have to follow the FDA rules for tobacco with nicotine. You know, now we're in a process where they're going to have to, but we saw what happened. We had these huge increases in youth vaping. And if we had just applied the rules that we already know are effective that we, we insist on for tobacco to vaping, we may have not, uh, we, we may have avoided that situation entirely. So, you know, I think that that's something that we need to think about when we're talking about regulating cannabis. We, we already have um, a lot of rules um, that, uh, that are applied to the tobacco industry, uh, you know, that I think have important impact. Um, we need to, uh, it, it, that should be a baseline of rules that we apply for cannabis. Now, there are different psychoactive substances. So some of the, there may be some, you know, different challenges, uh, but, you know, these are the kinds of regulatory schema that we should be thinking about. What's really challenging here is that because cannabis is um, in this gray area where it's illegal, of course, by federal law, uh, but now being legalized state by state, is that we don't have a federal authority to keep an eye on that. And that really um, imposes some burden, I think, on each state uh, to figure that all out um, and um, and actually implement uh, those rules, um, but you know I think that some of some of the uh, rules that you talked about are uh, exactly on target. So things like limiting concentration in the product, fifteen percent is actually I mean we're you know that's the cutoff that that Vermont is using. I think some other states are doing something similar. It's actually very concentrated, as you said back in the '90s, back in the 1970s. Uh, you know certainly. Uh, cannabis plants were in the range of about three, two to 3% THC. So 15% is, is actually quite a bit higher. Um, and then if we're going to apply the term cannabis or marijuana to other substances and also legalize them under the same, same rules, then it, they also have to be highly regulated. So for example, that, uh, you know, when we're talking about vaping liquids that contain cannabis, um, if, if, you know, in, in some ways when we say, okay, we have, we've legalized cannabis or marijuana, what does that really mean? So that really, you know, cannabis refers to a plant, um, 
are we going to call absolutely any product that has THC in it cannabis and thereby call it legal? Or should we have, um, or should we have a more thoughtful approach to it? Um, well, what, what, what I wanted to ask you is, what, what limit do you think should be? A, the, the Cannabis Control Board in our state will have the power to limit the amount of THC, 15%, yeah. 30%, whatever. What, what do you think is responsible in that regard? So I think that limitations on the uh, on the concentration of THC is important. It's not the only factors that determines how much uh, of an active ingredient a user might be exposed to. Um, so formulation or how we deliver the product, how people get use the product is also really important. That's particularly true with with people who are using vaping devices or other sorts of um, mechanisms to, to consume cannabis, right? So even, so concentration is no doubt, uh, you know, one of the, um, is probably the number one um, aspect of, of how high, um, of how much THC somebody will get. But there are also other things like the, the power of a, a device, how, you know, how strong the voltages of, the, of a vaping device that they're using, what other, what other components are going into the e-liquids, or even, we know this uh, also from tobacco, what other chemicals are going into any sorts of cigarettes that are uh, cannabis cigarettes that people will smoke. All of these things actually will influence how much THC people can get. This is why it's an incredibly complex topic. And it's, and I appreciate that it's hard for states, you know, that don't really have the machinery um, to really put these regulations out in an effective way. It's just, it's very burdensome to states, but it's really important that we do it. Um, it it's also the case that for tobacco and nicotine products that, that, that manufacturers are not allowed to sell flavored products because they're too attractive to teens. Um, and, uh, you know, flavored, you mean with a, like the taste of, of applesauce or <laughs> what kind of flavors are you talking yeah. about? Yeah. So for, so tobacco products, there was a time when tobacco products were, were flavored with all kinds of flavors. Vaping products are flavored with candy flavors, fruit flavors, dessert flavors. Um, uh, for tobacco products, flavors aren't allowed. For vaping products, there are still some flavored products on the market, but I think you're gonna see them disappear. We should be asking ourselves, should we be allowing cannabis products to come in, in, in flavors, in candies, in, in baked goods that are so attractive and so easy to use for younger people? So, well, the, the, the Cannabis Control Board here in Vermont would have the power to uh, prohibit uh, products being sold with THC content. Should, should would you, you be in favor of that? So I, you know, I, I personally would be in favor of uh, uh, of taking off the market products that are um, made as desserts, candy flavored, soft drinks, all of these really attractive and accessible products to youth. I, I don't think they should be on the market personally. You know, of course they tend to be very good sellers. Uh, you know, and so the industry would surely, um, you know, have a different op opinion on that. Uh, but I think, you know, again, using nicotine as the example, if we look what happens when we make these products, not only are they um, attractive to kids, but they also sort of give the message when, when, when you package THC into candy bars and into other, you know, products that really look like they're designed for children. It's actually giving a message that, hey, this is safe. That, you know, that's how, pe that's how the public tends to interpret these kinds of, uh, you know, this subtle message. So it makes a product look, look safe. It makes it easy to consume, right? Um, you, you know, if a kid gets into it, uh, a younger kid, it makes it easier for adolescents who may, uh, to consume these things. Um, and uh, it also gives the message that, this is a product for kids. I mean, I think that there's no other way to interpret, um, you know, a gummy bear product, right? I mean, I, you know, I, I, how can you look at that? And, 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 and it, it's a very confusing message to say, you know, here's a lollipop with THC in it, but it's not meant for children. I mean, lollipops are by definition for children. So it's a very confusing message. And I, I personally think that those products really should go, right? That, that doesn't, that could happen and you could still have 
uh, adult access to certain forms of legal cannabis, right? Uh, but where it's always attention is that, uh, you know, some of, the, some of these products would be very, very good sellers. And so the question is, how much do you let market forces uh, decide what the, what's going to be allowed and how much is this really driven by public health rather than trying to maximize uh, revenues? It's, it's uh, well, hmm. what could a, should a parent do if they have a child who's uh, getting involved with addiction to this stuff? Well, uh, uh, I would say that if you uh, think that your uh, child uh, may have developed a substance use problem, I would actually talk to a healthcare provider and I would start with your child's primary care provider and get advice. Again, these conditions are treatable, but it's really important that we treat and not ignore. Well, I'm, I'm just hoping that the Cannabis Control Board will adopt rules which will contain and prevent some of these problems from pro proliferating. When I heard that there were $2 billion worth of sales in Massachusetts, I was just, it's just mind boggling. You must be a very busy place. <laughs> well, Sharon, I'm sorry, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm up against my time limit. I think you've been terrific. I, uh, and I so admire what you're doing. I hope you uh, continue on and uh, have, su have success. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And right. ladies and gentlemen, I'm up against my time limit. I want to thank you for looking in. And uh, please uh, contact the station here if you have any suggestions for other things you'd like to hear about. Um, one of the things that's difficult about doing this job is I don't often get much feedback. <laughs> um, although once in a while, there are very nice things that are said. But I, I want to encourage the public to, uh, to let, let me know what you want to hear and what you think about these interviews are, are doing for you. Thank you, and thanks for looking in. So long. So long, Sharon. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thank you.